What is this? What is horror? What is this proclivity that we as humans have toward the macabre and disturbing? It's a tendency that seems counterintuitive, does it not? Why would we want to be scared? Perhaps it's the adrenaline. Perhaps it's an internalized fascination with that which we cannot understand. Or perhaps we are all just royally messed up. Whatever the case is, horror has been a part of humanity since before it was a genre. Consider ancient religions with their terrific gods and beasts ethereal concepts that even the wisest among us can barely grasp, and of course, the stories of hellish torture. Indeed, we are undeniably fixated with that which we cannot comprehend and that which makes us shiver until the nightmares take us away. In more contemporary times, horror has burrowed itself into our literature, our visual arts, our music, and certainly our movies. But there is another medium, another form of art, which really takes horror to another level. What could be more horrific than putting yourself in the midst of the action? Video games allow for this. Instead of reading about someone else experiencing something scary, or watching someone else on a screen experiencing something scary. You yourself can be the one experiencing it. And the possibilities are only growing more and more attractive as virtual reality is developed and refined. I myself am a fervent horror fan, as you can likely tell from my impassioned speech. I love to be scared to be presented with scenarios, real or unreal, that disturb me. I love horror because it forces you away from comfort and makes you think. And nothing is more scary than your own brain and the things it normally tries to hide from you. Now, I know I've already spoken at relative length about horror, but I want to draw attention to the fact that this video is about the scariest games, not the best horror games, and there is a difference. For example, Slender is a horror game. I do not find it scary. Fear is a horror game. I do not find it scary. Five Nights at Freddy's is a horror game. You get the drill. Horror as a genre has come to envelop several different subgenres, and the three games I just mentioned are not what I would call pure horror, that is, of the psychologically haunting variety. They are paranormal activity as compared to The Shining. They are the thrillers, the action games that deal more with surprises than real fear. Now. I don't dislike games like this at all, they can be a whole heap of fun, but what I want to talk about today are the games that, while they still might jump at you once in a while, rely more on genuine horror that disturbs you and sticks in your brain. As I said above, they are the horror that makes you think, the horror that leaves you with questions and no answers. As such, a lot of the standard fare you might see on other lists like this will be predominantly absent. Furthermore, there will be some games present on this list that might make you scratch your head a bit. How is this game possibly among the 10 scariest? Well, I will explain, and I have good reasons for each. It should go without saying, but this is my list, and it almost assuredly will not align with yours. It should also go without saying that I have only included games that I have personally experienced in one way or another, either through playing or viewing on YouTube. 
I want to share my opinions with you. And if you want to do the same, I suggest you go in the comments or make your own video. Anyone can do it. I did, and I'm an idiot. I should also say that spoilers are afoot. I do my best in this video to not spoil much of these games, but a smidgen of spoilers cannot be avoided when I'm talking down and dirty about what makes these games tick, you know? So just be warned. If you are curious about a game, then play it first before you watch this video. In fact, I recommend you go and play all of these games, as they are all worth your short attention spans. Anyway, without further ado, let's say you and I get going on this countdown. But, before we see the main attractions, let's have some more ado, while we take a moment to briefly address the 10 games that were closest to making it on the list, but just didn't make the cut. Close me. This game is more weird and off-putting than scary. I have to be honest, I had this intense unease the entire time playing this game which to me is enough to give it a spot in the mentions. But it just wasn't enough to reach the real list. Doki Doki Literature Club Like most people, I was very impressed with Doki Doki Literature Club when it first came out. I still love it, but in retrospect, it just doesn't do enough for me. Honestly, the Doki Doki part of this game, i.e., the build-up before it reveals itself as a horror game just drags on too much. Earthbound. Like some other games in the mentions, Earthbound has some truly unsettling and horrific moments, but they're only moments in a much longer game that's not anywhere near scary. If I was just picking game segments, then absolutely Earthbound would be in the top 10, but I'm thinking of games as holes. I have no mouth, and I must scream. A really cool little point-and-click game based on the classic Harlan Ellison story of the same name. The overarching feel of this game is one of horror and hopelessness, but matched with clunky gameplay and age style, it feels more like a pseudo-Lovecraft story. Cool, but not terribly scary. Keep in mind. An understated and simple game with intense mental health themes. It's not very long and definitely worth checking out, but just couldn't make the cut. Portal 1 and 2 Most people probably would never think to include these games on a list like this, but when you consider the story occurring in the background, it's truly messed up. The Rat Man easter eggs in particular highlight this well, but again, just not scary enough. Sentient. This one is probably the closest to being on the actual list. It's a brilliant little game with two particularly memorable moments of pure horror. You better believe this list is going to be good if this game didn't make the cut. Spooky's Jump Scare Mansion This game is actually brilliant. It appears surface level to be a goofy horror parody game, which it is, but it has its own brand of unique and disturbing horror that makes it worth mentioning. White Day, a labyrinth named School. In particular, I would actually point to the original 2001 game as being scarier, although the recent remake is sufficient, especially considering you have to be a wizard to play the original. A really cool game, but more of the thriller action type scary than the deeply upsetting horror I'm seeking. Year Walk. 
This one is undoubtedly the most visually appealing game on the list, mention or actual top 10 entry. Based on Swedish folklore, this game has a unique and deeply unnerving tone that permeates the whole game. Definitely worth checking out. Okay, now that I've gone through the runners up, it's time to get to the main attraction. Let's get spooky. There is a whole era of horror games on the internet that have one thing in common. The RPG Maker Game Engine. They were most popular in the early to mid 2010s with the YouTube popularity of such games as Ao Oni, Eeb, and Mad Father, among others. However, they still have a presence even now. Now, there are a whole lot of these types of games and honestly, a lot of them are definitely worth checking out. But if you ask me, and by watching this video you implicitly are asking me, no RPG horror game better represents this little niche subgenre than The Witch's House. I believe this game to be the most fun, most interesting, and indeed, the most scary. In this game, you play as a young, blonde-haired girl, apparently named Viola. You wake up in the woods with nothing but a note in your pocket from your father. Trapped from leaving the forest by an indestructible barrier of roses, your only option is to go inside the mysterious mansion to the north. I won't say any more about the plot, as it's up to you to voyage deeper into the house and unravel what's going on for yourself. Trust me, if you play this game thoroughly, you will not be disappointed. I put this game at the bottom of the list because frankly, it has some issues. Keeping in mind that the point of this video is to discuss the scariness of games, The Witch's House definitely isn't going to be giving you nightmares. By and large, this game does have wonderful atmosphere, morbid puzzles, and a satisfying amount of violence and gore. It is creative in its horror, and I have to give it a lot of credit for that. My main problem with this game's horror is that it relies too heavily on jump scares, which I mentioned in the intro generally don't impress me. Admittedly, the jump scares in this game are very unique and catch even my jaded ass off guard, but they are still jump scares nonetheless. So why is it on the list above any other game? Well. I have a few reasons for that, and they all involve the game's greatest strength, its subtlety. Don't get me wrong, this game has plenty of very overt horror, but the best parts of this game are the parts that some players might actually miss. I of course don't want to spoil anything, but you will benefit from being a bit experimental with this game. Try some weird stuff, explore around, go back to the places you've just finished with before moving on. You will see some interesting things, many of which other players, including myself, probably missed. Trust me, these little hidden moments are some of the best in the whole game. I gave a brief plot synopsis earlier on, but I do have to commend the storytelling in this game. Again, the players that aren't being careful can absolutely skip over the story inadvertently, so be attentive. It's a creepy little tale. And though there's not much of it, it is one of the highlights. Finally, I have to comment on what I think is the greatest and scariest aspect of this game. The ending. Now, there are several endings to this game. I got two of them in my playthrough, but reading up online it seems that there are four endings, each of which expands the game's lore and makes the experience all the richer. If you don't have time to get all four, you certainly need to get two of them. The standard ending is easy enough to get. Just complete the game as you normally would without doing anything extra. The true ending, however, is where the storytelling really shines, featuring one of the craziest twists I have ever seen. Without saying too much, I'll just say that you need to revisit something you probably noticed early on and forgot about. Before moving on to game number 9, 
I would just like to talk about the aspects of this game other than the horror real quick. The majority of gameplay involves solving peculiar and often obscure puzzles in order to proceed through the house. Fail to solve the puzzles and, well, things generally don't end well. As obtuse as some of the puzzles can be, I really enjoy solving them. I promise you've hardly ever seen puzzles as unique as this game's. You might need to consult a walkthrough at a few points, but try to avoid doing so as much as possible. Overall, not only is this game decently scary and thrilling, but it's also a good bit of fun. I'd recommend checking it out. The original 2012 version of the game is still available as freeware online, so you really have no excuse. Alternatively, if you have some money burning a hole in your checking account, there is a remastered version available on Steam with some new content. Now, considering this game will take most people an hour and a half to two hours to complete, maybe up to five hours for completionists who want to get every little drop out of it, the price is a little steep. It costs $17.49 Canadian, which is around $14.49 US. Purchase it if you like, I did, but again, the original version is available for free, and that is beyond a shadow of a doubt worthwhile. If this was a countdown about the best stories in gaming, which is a countdown I would love to do sometime, the cat lady would be right near the top. Sorry about the potential future countdown spoilers. However, as you are all well aware, this is not a list about stories. This is a list about scariness. Because of that, I had to drop the cat lady down a ways. But don't think for a moment that this game is unworthy of a place in my top 10. In The Cat Lady, you play as Susan Ashworth, a middle-aged woman living by herself in a dreary, decrepit flat. Now, it's not even remotely a spoiler to say that Susan commits suicide, because it's literally the first thing that happens. She narrates her suicide note, says goodbye to her cats, and then wakes up in a billowing field of grain. In this area, which appears to be some sort of afterlife, Susan meets an old woman who identifies herself as the Queen of Maggots. The Queen offers to return Susan to life and give her another chance at happiness, but at the cost of requiring her to hunt down and dispose of five murderers, which the Queen calls the Parasites. Throughout the game, you will learn about Susan's past, explore her psyche, and experience one of gaming's greatest and most underrated storytelling experiences. Now that I've hyped up this game's story to high heaven, allow me to break the news. Though this game is absolutely an example of psychological horror, it would be far more accurate to call it a drama that features aspects of horror. Because of this, because the focus of the game is so much in the story and the characters, the horror can be a bit of a letdown at times. I don't want to downplay it too much, because there's still lots of great psychological horror to be found, but I simply couldn't put it all that much higher on the list. Most of the game's horror comes from the implications of the game. If I were to compare the Cat Lady to a more popular piece of horror media, I would have to bring up Silence of the Lambs. What I mean by this is that the scariest thing about both the Cat Lady and Silence of the Lambs is that they could both largely happen in real life. Yes, the Cat Lady definitely has a supernatural side, and even a bit of a strange sci-fi side at times, but the vast majority of the game's scariest moments are performed by the aforementioned Parasites who are all criminals in the vein of Buffalo Bill. Realistic, if somewhat exaggerated, sadistic, and horrific humans. Yes, humans. Your neighbors, your friends, your loved ones. To me, 
the horror that could actually happen tends to be some of the scariest. Sure, there's lots of horror to be found in the paranormal, the things that your brain just can't quite explain, and there will surely be some of that to come on this list. But few things could be scarier than things that could actually happen to you. So, how do the other aspects of this game, aside from the story and the horror, hold up? Well, this is where the game gets rough around the edges. The gameplay is simplistic, which is not inherently a bad thing, but can get tiring after a while. There are long stretches of game where you have to solve extended puzzles, some of which are a good bit of fun to solve, but I often just find myself wanting to get back to the story. The graphics are extremely unique, but sometimes can be a little hard to look at. I think the graphics work really well with the game's style and themes, but I can't say they're objectively good. The game is actually fully voice acted, which is really cool for a game as underground as this. Though I must say, some of the voice acting leaves a little to be desired. Fortunately, the characters you hear the most are pretty decent, and I don't think any of it is horrible enough to distract from the good parts of the game. The music is also really solid all the way through, and definitely enhances the atmosphere. My main problem with the music and sound design is that the transitions between scenes and songs are often jarring, and don't really flow all that well. Finally, I have to applaud two other aspects of the game, the characters and the writing. This game is really a character study at its core, exploring depression and mental health through the protagonist. However, the secondary protagonist, Mitzi Hunt, is also a very well-written character in her own right and makes for a great foil to Susan. In fact, perhaps the greatest part of this game is the relationship between Susan and Mitzi. You'll come to love them, cheer for them, cry with them, and get so invested in their stories you won't want to stop playing. Flawed as the game may be, I cannot help but love it. Let it be taken as high praise for the story's characters and writing that all the fairly significant problems I mentioned don't detract from why this game is a masterpiece of drama and psychological horror. If you want to play it for yourself, and you absolutely should, it's available on Steam for $11.49 Canadian or about $9.50 US. Generally speaking, the game will take you about 7 to 9 hours to beat, so if you ask me, the price is a steal. Buy it, play it, no need to thank me. Have you ever wanted to play the video game equivalent of the Twilight Zone? Well, it's your lucky day. Stories Untold is an anthology of four experimental, smaller games that involve a variety of play styles and themes and may or may not all actually be linked to a centralized story. This game is clearly a product of the Stranger Things, I remember the 80s, boom, and it does it well. I can't really tell you much about the story without spoiling something, but I can say that it is very well told and will likely have you widening your eyes in shock a time or two. Stories Untold made my list for its unique take on psychological horror and incredibly subtle writing. The game often uses its form to tell the story, which makes it all the more effective. What I mean is that this game needs to be a game and wouldn't work nearly as well in any other form. I could make an argument that the previous two games on this list would perhaps be better as a book or a movie or something, but this game makes good use of the fact that it's a game and involves the player in the horror. By the end of the game, you will feel like a part of the action. You'll feel the game pointing its finger at you, and you'll even feel guilty for things you had no actual involvement in. It's a powerful thing. Each of the four episodes are noteworthy, but I have to say my personal favorite is the very first one, 
The House Abandon. It's a masterclass in atmospheric horror that makes you feel both like the nervous homeowner who suspects an intruder is in their house and the intruder themselves at the same time. It's a really unique experience. But as I said, each episode is great and will make you feel the discomfort of horror in its own way. As for the gameplay, you will be participating in several different kinds of game, from 80s style text adventure, instruction based puzzle solving, and even some first person exploration. Each style of gameplay doesn't feel tangential to the game, but is actually incorporated into the story in a cool way. It's a rare example of synergy between story and gameplay, and it's highly refreshing. That being said, the puzzles are not easy. This is fine by me, as it offered a challenge that made me feel like a professional whenever I solved one, but be prepared to rack your brain a little bit. There's actually one puzzle in the second episode I couldn't solve. Like, I couldn't even actually figure out how to solve it. I don't, I don't know what the game wanted from me. I checked a walkthrough, and I still have no idea how it's meant to be solved. Yeah, it's uh, one of those puzzles. Stories Untold is the most easily accessible game I've discussed on the list so far, being available on Steam, Nintendo Switch, PlayStation 4, and Xbox One. I played it on the Switch, and I was somewhat concerned going in about how the game would play without a mouse and keyboard, but they actually did a pretty good job of translating it to the controller. If you have a decent gaming computer, that would be my first recommendation, but it's more than playable on console as well. It costs about $10.99 Canadian, or around $9.99 US, on each system. It took me about two and a half hours to beat all four episodes, which seems to be the consensus by most other players. I would say that's pretty good value. The experience is short, but very effective. I know it shouldn't be surprising on a scary games countdown to expect some brutal and vile content, but I feel I need to give an extra warning about this game. Seriously, in terms of giving viewer discretion, this is the craziest game on this list. It's full of gore, sadistic torture, and just all around awful things happening to people. And most of it happens to children, which really just elevates it to a whole other level. Yeah, it's a real bastard of a game. During a late night gathering of friends, in which the crew are saying their goodbyes to one of them who is moving away, nine people engage in a ceremony that is meant to bring eternal friendship to them all. This sweet sentiment is cut short, however, when the classroom they are in is swept into an alternate dimension ruled by restless, cruel spirits. Separated from one another, they must find a way to reconnect and escape the hellish realm they found themselves in. Though they quickly find this is neither simple, nor without its horrendous costs. It might not sound like much from that description, in fact it sounds kind of silly, but this game is mentally harrowing. Nearly every piece of text in this game feels like it was written by the most evil writer to ever touch a keyboard. I obviously don't want to get into specifics right now, in case the steadfast among you would like to experience the game for yourselves, but trust me when I say you will be in for a bad time. I mean, it's a good game overall, with lots of great shocking moments for horror fans, but you won't feel any happiness as you go through it. This is really the game's major strength, its pure shock factor. This is the first game on this list that I could legitimately imagine myself having nightmares from. This game does not shy away from showing you the darkest recesses of the writer's brain. I can't imagine they possibly took anything out of this game because it went too far, simply because the game itself is already too far. You know that feeling you get in your stomach when you hear about 
really awful real world events like school shootings yeah that's kind of how this game feels and it's in no small part because as i mentioned almost all of the victims of this game's torture are children some of them quite young children in terms of gameplay corpse party is a mix of rpg adventure and visual novel you go around the school collecting items to use in puzzles and intermittently get some character dialogue or descriptions of brutal violence, sometimes both at the same time. It isn't the most compelling game when you're actually playing it, but it certainly draws the player in with its story. The characters are good for the most part. Some of them are very much just stock characters, but they fit in with the themes of the game, so I see no reason to give the developers too much grief over this. They do interesting things with most of the characters, so it works out. The game is very anime, which makes sense considering it is a Japanese-developed game. Uh, but if you don't know what I mean by this game is very anime, then it might not be for you. So, how do you play this game? Well, there are several versions in existence. The versions that the fans like best are the PSP and 3DS versions. But if you're anything like me, then you don't really have an accessible way to play those. There's also a Steam version, which I must confess is the one I played. I know, legit fans of this game are crying into their Kishinuma body pillows right now, but it really was the most available version for me. From what I hear, the Steam version is easily the worst, but it still has high ratings from casual fans and newbies, such as me, so it seems to me that it's just bad by comparison. I enjoyed it anyway. The big difference between the Steam version and the others is that the art is different in, I must admit, a strange and bad way. It's just a weird choice of art style for a game of these kinds of themes. Sometimes a clash in style and substance works for the best, but and not in this case. Also, apparently the original game's CG art is missing from the Steam version, which I'm 50-50 on caring about. First of all, imagining what's going on when the text describes it can let your brain create far more gruesome images than any artist could convey. And second, from what I can see, a lot of the CG art involves weird, unnecessary fan service, often in the form of panty shots. Like, really? Am I losing out on the real corpse party experience by not getting to see high schoolers' panties? I think not. Make up your own mind, but I think the Steam version is fine. I can't really speak for what other versions will cost you, but I will say that the Steam version is $16.99 Canadian, or about $14 US. Perhaps a little pricey, but it's a decent 10 hours casual playthrough, and it has some replay value if you want to find all of the wrong endings. <laughs> To the very core of my being, I never want to play this game again. First of all, let me just say that I might be kind of compromising some of what I said at the beginning of the video. This game is almost purely thriller jump scares. In Nun Massacre, you play as one Mrs. McDonnell, who receives a letter from the Catholic boarding school your daughter attends. Apparently, your daughter has fallen ill, and because the school is so old-fashioned, they don't even have a phone, you have to go there in person to address the situation. It becomes apparent almost immediately that something unholy is occurring within the walls of this school, and you have to figure out what. All the while being stalked by a homicidal nun with bleeding eyes and a knife. So. How did Nun Massacre get onto my list? I said at the beginning of the video that I consider thrillers and horror games to be of different ilks. So what gives? Why is this game among the scariest of all time? Because 
It is the most unbelievably thrilling game I have ever played. My heart was racing the entire time I played it, dreading every moment leading up to the encounters with the titular nun. I have to give this game props, because it does something very unique that I don't see much in horror games. Nun Massacre uses jump scares to boost the actual horror of the game, and it combines both the thriller aspects and the horror to create something truly dreadful, and for that, I must say this game is something special. That being said, I still have to hold it back a bit for its over-reliance on jump scares. Again, this game has THE best jump scares of all time. It will keep you on the edge of your seat for the entire playthrough. But at the end of the day, I have to ask myself, am I being haunted by this game? Do I think about this game after playing it and still feel the implications? No, not so much. I leave my shaking hands at the keyboard when I close this game. There are some parts of Nun Massacre that are more akin to my kind of horror, like the mind-bendingly peculiar vent ending, but the most apparent part of this game's scariness is the constant threat of being found by the nun, which is the most horrific experience ever at the time you have it, but it doesn't leave you with much of anything. Again, true horror to me is something that disturbs you and makes you think about it later and feel that same dread. Playing Nun Massacre is a roller coaster of a game, and much like a roller coaster, you quickly lose that sense of fear after you get off. So, what's it like to play this game? Well, you'll likely be so distracted by the insanity of being stalked by the nun, you'll forget where you are, what you're doing, and what your goal is. This game is the most thrilling video game experience you can have, but it's not a whole lot of fun particular because it's just so upsetting. Again, this is coming from somebody who's pretty jaded to jump scares. I would certainly recommend it to horror extremophiles, because there's nothing really like it, but this is a bad one for the weaker fans. Like, if Five Nights at Freddy scares you, don't play Nun Massacre. The gameplay mostly involves semi-obtuse inventory puzzles and hiding from the incessant presence of your impending demise. I do have gripes with the limited inventory space, which only allows you to hold three items at a time. In some ways, this adds a level of threat to the game, because you'll have to sacrifice the items you want for the items you need, or else come back later when you have a free space. On the other hand, because you are constantly threatened by the nun, and there is no save feature in the game, the limited inventory is more frustrating than anything. Maybe this is also supposed to be part of the deal, but it didn't help the experience for me. I feel like this game is every unfriendly, hateful wish of the devs put into one single experience, and I both love it and hate it because of that. I also have to comment on the visuals, which are extremely effective for the style of game they're going for. I recommend turning off the CRT effect and putting the graphics on PSX, which just makes the game look more clear, but that's up to you of course. The game is developed by the modern kings of indie horror games, Puppet Combo, and if you know anything about them, you already know what this game looks like. Everything is pixelated, blocky, the textures warp in uncomfortable ways as you approach them. It feels like a remnant of the original PlayStation days, and I really do love that. This game would be far less scary if the graphics were more realistic. They are perfect the way they are, uh, so long as you turn off CRT and switch to PSX. If you want to purchase this game, it can only be bought on Itch.io or Puppet Combo's Patreon. On Itch.io, the game costs about $6 Canadian, which is something like $4.95 US. Uh, for what this game is, I can hardly recommend it more. How long it takes you to beat will totally depend on you, because like I said, this game has no save feature, auto or otherwise. If you die, the game closes and you start all over. 
Some of you may beat it on your first try, which itself will differ on how cautious you are and which of the endings you get. On average, you'll most likely get a good handful of hours out of it, and you will be seeping liquids out of every orifice the whole time you play. Those of you who are regular viewers of this channel may recognize the name of this game. Uh, but who am I kidding, right? I don't have regular viewers. That's right, it's that game I made a single Let's Play video of and then quit because I don't want to make Let's Play videos anymore. But, lo and behold, it is in fact a worthy contender on my scariest games list. In Lisa the Painful, you play as Brad Armstrong, a man who has to survive in a Mad Max post-apocalypse in which any and all females have died out. One day, while ingesting drugs, Brad comes across a baby. Recognizing this baby to be the one female left in the world, Brad pledges to raise her in secret as his daughter in order to save her from the viciousness of the world around her. One day, while out for a walk, Brad comes home to find his friends dead and Buddy, the young girl, kidnapped. Now, Brad must combat against mutants, gangs, guys who roll around in barrels, evil fast food mascots, Satan himself, and the demons from his past, all in order to save his daughter. Sounds like a very unique, interesting story, doesn't it? But does it really sound all that scary? Dramatic, maybe, but scary? Well, let me tell you, this game is several heaping spoonfuls of dramatic, hilarious, imaginative, disgusting, psychological, and yes, scary. Holy Lord above, for how charming and funny this game often is, it can also present some of the scariest imagery you will ever see. If I had to put a single word down to describe this game's horror, I would simply say it's disturbing. Seriously, it's just messed up in the best way possible. While there are a lot of things in this game I could point to as the major source of scariness, I don't want to spoil much, and I don't want to get too long-winded. So as an example, I will point to the Joy Mutants. Unsurprisingly, for a post-apocalyptic world, this game has mutants. But as generic an idea as that sounds, the mutants in this game are very special. They are the most grotesque, abominable, horrific mutations of the human body you will ever see. David Cronenberg, eat your heart out. I won't spoil anything particular about this one specific encounter, but perhaps the highlight for me is when you meet Henry Wyatt. Those of you who already know are slowly nodding in agreement, and the rest of you, I assume, are digging for your wallets to buy this game and figure out what I mean. So, Brilliant as the story, writing, and visuals are, how does the rest of the game compare? Well, first of all, the music is amazing. Like, seriously, top-tier music. Did I mention this whole game is made by one person? Yeah, mental. Unfortunately, this game does have some faults, and they're not insignificant. First of all, the gameplay is lackluster. It's an RPG-style adventure game, but I can't really give it many points for fun. The battle system is minimally improved from pure turn-based combat, but only minimally. It's repetitive, but at least the enemy design is good. In fact, almost every battle in the game is against a unique enemy with their own name and dialogue, which is impressive. One more thing I must comment on, and it is a positive, is the amazing way the game handles choice and player input. First of all, there is oodles of side content in this game. Like, way more side content than main story. Which isn't a bad thing because the side content is also great. Furthermore, your choices in the game really matter and can have dramatic impact on your future in the game. Which is something you hardly ever see in gaming. 
Also, this game has the single most asinine, ridiculous easter egg I have ever seen. It is a pure troll, only included to piss off the player, and I love it. If you know, you know. If you would like to play Lisa the Painful, then you will have to go on Steam and spend $10.99 Canadian or around $9 US. Frankly, it's so worth it. As I've said, this game really isn't all that much fun to play, but almost everything else about it is the best of the best. You'll easily get 10 hours out of this game, probably more if you explore and take in the world. So yeah, I'd say just drop your money right into the dev's bank account. You want to talk about pure atmospheric horror? Here is your golden cow. This game knows how to creep you out, make you uncomfortable, and raise your pulse. And all without any outright jump scares. Yes, you heard me correct, I did not stutter. Not a single jump scare. Well, maybe just one or two very minor ones. I'm not saying there's nothing in this game to make you jump at all, but nothing major. Only little things used very specifically to great effect. In Anatomy, you explore a house. That's, yeah, that's, that's about it. You find cassette tapes that contain Alan Watts-esque voice clips and play them, and you just take in the horror. Trust me, it doesn't sound like much, but this game's utter atmosphere cannot be contended with. It's the perfect example of how to do scary without needing a zombie face to scream BOO at the player as they round a corner. Anatomy is kind of a small-time indie title, which is a shame because I think it deserves to go down as one of horror gaming's greatest moments. If I do one good thing with this video, it will be to showcase this game for a bigger audience. And yes, I can hear you. I can hear the dissenters in the viewership of this video. Those of you who get jumped by Freddy Fazbear, close the window, and proceed to proclaim on the internet about how FNAF is the scariest thing to ever happen. I can hear you saying this game, Anatomy, isn't scary. Frankly, first of all, how dare you say so after having only watched a video of somebody else playing it with all the lights on in your basement room? No. This game does not have a ghoulie waiting at the top of the stairs to make you go poo-poo in your diapy. But, as I have said over and over in this video, that's not horror. That's suspense. That's a thriller. This video is about scary, real, genuine horror, and anatomy oozes that. By the way, I don't hate Five Nights at Freddy's, at least the first game. The first FNAF was a creative, thrilling experience, but it's not scary. Also, sorry for insulting everyone, that was uncalled for. Doesn't mean I'm going to erase it from my script, but I will apologize. Anyway, play anatomy for yourself. Seriously, just do it. This is pretty much the perfect game to put on in the dark with the volume in your headphones cranked. Tell me you don't have even a little trouble falling asleep that night. I dare you. If you want to play this game, and you should because it's amazing, it's available on Itch.io for a mere $2.99 US or around $3.60 Canadian. It's cheap, short, and very easy to play, and you'll be happy you did. It's not quite an hour long, so don't think you'll be getting a game of epic proportions for your money, but I would still say it's certainly worth it. Also, and the game's included documents make this clear, Anatomy may or may not be one of those games that isn't over when it at first may seem to be. I'm not going to say much more, but just be cautious you don't quit the game before it's totally over. Oh, 
Yeah, yeah, I see. The Outer Wilds, huh? Yeah, no, that, that totally makes sense. It's like the premier horror game. Except, wait. The Outer Wilds? That quirky indie space exploration game is in the top three scariest games of all time? Remember at the beginning of this video when I said some of my choices might leave you scratching your head? This is the one in particular I had in mind. And I shall explain why, but there are other things to say first. The most important thing being, drop everything, stop watching this video, and play The Outer Wilds. Seriously, I cannot possibly recommend enough that you play this game totally blind before looking anything up about it. I am one of the poor jackasses who watched this game played on YouTube before playing it myself, and that is a regret I will have to live with for the rest of my life. I'm only trying to save you from my fate. Also, before I get to the horror, I have to tell you what it's about. In the Outer Wilds, you wake up on your little comfy planet ready to embark on your first journey into space. Things at home seem a little odd, but it's probably just the first time jitters. Anyway, how eventful could your first space flight really be? Okay, I'm not saying any more about the game's story or concept, because it's vitally important that you play it knowing as little as possible. Do not spoil anything about it for yourself. And with that said, how do I explain how scary this game is without spoiling it? The answer is very carefully. When I say this game is scary, I mean it's scary in a real life sense. Like, this game's fear goes beyond the boundaries of the game itself and makes me feel uneasy in my own existence. Uneasy, yet somehow also serene? It's a weird feeling to be at once terrified and content with the existential dread this game brings about. It's a cosmic horror, a glance at the unknowable everything that pervades the universe. This game takes all you think you know and throws it away, and you're along for the ride. You'll feel your heart drop at the implications, and yet be left with a warm sensation in your gut, telling you it's going to be okay. That doesn't stop it from being terrifying, but at least it's hopeful. I mean, really, who says horror has to be pessimistic? If I were to compare The Outer Wilds to another piece of fiction, I would have to say it reminds me a lot of 2001 A Space Odyssey, which, by the way, is a great movie and probably my favorite book of all time. 2001 is also not explicitly a horror story, but it does scare the hell out of me, especially the book. If you're familiar with 2001 and this comparison intrigues you to try The Outer Wilds, then please do. The Outer Wilds is more... hipstery, I guess? But don't let that turn you off. It's more modern for sure, but not in a bad way. Anyway, I'm not sure how much more I can say without spoiling something if I haven't already, Here's the thing, this game's a masterpiece. I really cannot possibly recommend you play it more. You will be mind blown. I actually really want to do another video in the future entirely about how amazing this game is and why, so keep an eye out for that in like five years if my current upload schedule is to be believed. Just in time for this game to be significantly less relevant. Eh, maybe my video will kick it into a renaissance. Anyway, since everyone watching this is going to play it, because it's now required by law, I should tell you how you can play The Outer Wilds. First of all, you're in luck, because whatever kind of gamer you are, there's a way to play this game. It's available on Steam, Xbox, PlayStation, and there's even a Switch port coming later this year. You have no excuse. It costs $28.99 Canadian, or something like $24.99 US, which is honestly the best deal you'll ever get. I would pay twice that amount for this game. It'll probably take you 20 hours or so to beat it, but that time is very dependent on you as a player. It's, it's really, I mean guys, it's just really worth it. Just 
God damn it, people. Just do it. Uh-oh. Looks like we've got another very weird pick in the top three. Now, to start off, I need to clarify something. This is another game in the same series as The Cat Lady from earlier in the video. This game was actually made first in 2009, before The Cat Lady, as a point-and-click adventure, and then after The Cat Lady found its own level of success, Downfall was remade in the same style as The Cat Lady. For the purposes of this list, I'm actually referring exclusively to the original 2009 version. Yes, the remake of Downfall has a better story, better gameplay, and is pretty much just all around a better experience. Except for the horror part of it. The developer was able to improve upon every facet of their game with the remake, but they just couldn't make it as scary. And by Jove, the original is scary. There are several reasons for this, which I will explain after I tell you what Downfall is all about. You play as Joe Davis, a troubled man married to his troubled wife, Ivy Davis. While taking a little trip meant to save their marriage, Joe and Ivy stop at the Quiet Haven Hotel to spend the night during a storm. During the night, however, some haunting presence captures the hotel seemingly caused by the enigmatic Sophie. Joe has to traverse the hotel and deal with all the horrors therein in order to find and save his wife. But, as the story goes on, questions must be raised. Is any of this really happening, or is Joe just going mad? Now, let me be perfectly clear, this game is rough. Like, I said the cat lady was rough, but this game is rough. Remember that I'm specifically talking about the 2009 original version of the game when I say this. If you want to experience Downfall, I almost recommend you just play the remake, even though I think the original is significantly scarier. Why? Because of all the games on this countdown list, this is the one that I think is the most me. To most other people, the original version of Downfall probably just seems janky and poorly aged. And it is, but I think that adds to the scariness. To be honest, I'm not sure I can really describe to you why I think this game is so scary. It's just a feeling. The overarching aura of this game just hits me in a particular way, and I can't promise anyone else that it will do the same for them. This game makes me so deeply uncomfortable, like it truly upsets me. And again, I doubt anyone else would agree with me. Some might agree about the remake, but I kind of doubt it for the original. It really is just probably a personal thing. But I can't help it. This game does things to me, and no amount of bartering with myself will change that. And therefore, despite the fact that I'm undoubtedly alone, this game is my number two pick. Other than the general jank of this game, which again, I think enhances the fear factor, this game is very strange. This might be a little bit of a spoiler, but this game is very psychological. And because of that, I think nothing in this game is uncalled for or unnecessary. And trust me, there are some things in this game that at first feel seem very uncalled for. Things that no writer worth their fingers would put into their narrative. But it really does work in this game. And for one unifying reason. It all goes back to Joe. And it all just gives you insight into a truly twisted mind. Like, if you interpret this game as being all in Joe's mind, then what other horrible person in history or fiction could even match the level of mania present in Joe? 
I think that's part of what scares me so much about this, that in terms of psychology, this game is very real. Sure, you meet ghosts and other supernatural beings, but if it's all Joe, then... I don't know, man. That makes it far scarier to me. Okay, yeah, ghosts can be scary, but not nearly as scary as people. And when you figure out that the man you are controlling is the way he is, you almost just have to feel sickened. I'm actually kind of curious to hear in the comments if you have a similar feeling when playing this game. You know, if anyone watching this has even heard of this game, let alone played it. In terms of how the game plays, again, lots and lots of jank. No offense to the developer whatsoever, but it seems they may not have had the clearest grasp on game development at the time. If you're looking for a smooth gaming experience, then just play the remake. But if you want those unexplainable spooks that come from lower quality graphics and sound, then the original may be for you. If you want to play either version, then you will find them in the same place. The remake can be bought on Steam for $11.49 Canadian, or about $9 US, and in fact, it comes with the original as a free bonus. So, you can play both for the price of one. I would recommend it. The story isn't as good as The Cat Lady, if you ask me, but it's still solid and it's a lot scarier, original or remake. The original has a playtime of around 3 hours, and the remake is a similar length to The Cat Lady, so it's good value. If you are so inclined, play the 2009 version and let me know in the comments what you thought. I'm curious to find out how weird I am for putting this game at the number 2 spot. You. But, before moving on to number one, we've been through a lot so far. We've seen some truly scary, messed up, disturbing things. So why not take a little break to share a funny story? Want to hear about the first time I ever fear quit a video game? It's uh, kind of risky for my reputation as a jaded horror fan, but I think you'll appreciate my honesty. So, uh, want to try and guess what game it was that caused little young me to rapidly shut off the console and not continue the game for several years? I'll give you a hint. It was released in 2002. Another hint? Okay. It was published by EA. Still not getting it. I, I don't blame you. All those super scary horror games published by EA in 2002. No wonder you can't guess it. One more hint. Sure, it was a movie tie-in game. Yeah, some of you might be cluing in now, uh, but for those of you who aren't, I will spill the beans. The game that caused me to fear quit was Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets for the Nintendo GameCube. Yes, this is completely true. I turned off this game at one point and didn't play it again for a very long time. Uh, I guess I should explain a little bit. So, I've been a big Harry Potter fan my whole life. Still am, actually. And, uh, even though this was the only Harry Potter game that wasn't made of Lego that I ever played, I really loved this game as a kid. I, I was practically addicted when I first played it. Now, even as a casual fan will know, there are ghosts in Harry Potter. In this game, some of the ghosts act as enemies. In fact, I think the particular ghosts in question that scared me out of the game are these ones that I'm showing on the screen. I'm not entirely sure, but I do remember them not having the lower part of their bodies, so it seems to add up. And yeah, they scared my tiny little head off. I think it was something about the way they moved, you know, they, they kind of stretch their arms out toward you as if they're going in for a hug and then they take your life. I mean, looking at the picture now, they're pretty goofy, 
I would love so much though to play that game again and to see what all the fuss was about. I bet you dollars to dog nuts. I just laugh, imagining my younger self sitting next to me as I play, cowering in fear at nothing at all. Anyway, <laughs> just a, a humorous little tangent before we move on to the scariest game of all time. No big deal. So, um, why don't we move on to the scariest game of all time now? Yeah, now, now seems like a good time. Well, well, well. My list is exclusively indie games up to this point, and suddenly the number one spot goes to a triple A studio developed game. Yep, I've officially sold out. Okay, so I have to be frank with you, I've never played PT, and unfortunately, I will never be able to. Now, the reason for this is that PT doesn't actually exist. At least, it doesn't anymore. Uh, let me set the scene for you. In 2014, PlayStation 4 gamers were met with a mysterious horror game released on the online store with almost no context and only a random mention at GamesCon earlier that year. Those who played it were met with an obtuse game with difficult puzzles and a seemingly endless looping hallway. Many would drop the game out of confusion or frustration, but those who battled through to the end got the surprise of their lives. PT was not a game, not really, it was a playable teaser. And what it was teasing was a new Silent Hill game, being worked on by both Hideo Kojima and Guillermo del Toro, and of course featuring Norman Reedus, without the funky fetus. Now, it's no spoiler to say that this game never saw the light of day and was cancelled in 2015. Subsequently, PT was removed from the PS4 store, never to be seen again. So much hype for no payoff. Which is a shame, because PT is the scariest game ever made. I don't say this lightly. You know a game must be utterly terrifying when I can call it the scariest game ever, having only watched other people play it on YouTube. But I do say it, and I don't feel wary about it. PT is utterly brilliant. It's a masterpiece of storytelling, atmosphere, and yes, horror. In PT, you wake up in a dark room facing a single lit up door. You go through the door, walk through a quaint looking hallway, and then proceed through the other door at the end. You go downstairs, through one more door, only to find yourself in the same exact hallway again. As you continue through this hallway time and time again, things change and you must deal with those changes, or else lose yourself to the loop. And. By you, in this case, I of course mean the Let's Player you're watching play it. Now, the influence that PT has had on horror video games cannot be overstated. Even today, you see cheaply made indie games that attempt the looping hallway shtick to no success. PT did it first, PT did it best. Now, much like many of the other games on my list, the real horror of PT is the psychological. The aspects of the human mind and the evil done 
by your very own neighbors. The fact that the game tells the story the way it does is what gives it the edge, of course, but this game truly is, much like Downfall, about a person who is tremendously sick in the head. Now, I can't really tell you much about how it plays, how much it costs, or how to play it, because it doesn't exist anymore. Now, there are fan versions being made, some of which seem very professional, but I have to wonder, can they ever really match the original experience? I'm not too sure. But honestly, part of me thinks that if I could play PT, it might go down on my list. Seriously, I mean that. Part of this game's horror is that it's a dead relic. Something you can watch or hear about, but never yourself experience. There is, of course, evidence that PT existed at one point, and there are ways to second-handedly experience it, but if you haven't already, you yourself will probably never play it. It's like a horror story that somebody tells you around a campfire, a ghost tale written in a compilation book by an anonymous writer. The fact that PT doesn't exist gives it this legendary status. And while I can't really speak to whether that holds up, whether those who actually did play it would agree, I can say that to me, PT is a rumor, a cryptid. And while the game itself is very scary, and the story it tells is disturbing and compelling, PT is something that essentially no other game could ever be. A myth unto itself. And that, dear friends, is my list of the scariest video games of all time. I hope you enjoyed it and are inclined to play the games for yourselves, because on no front here will you be disappointed. I know this list is probably one of the more unique ones you've seen. Like, seriously, I'm pretty sure no other Scariest Games list has even half of these games put together on it. But still, I'm very happy about it, and I stand by my choices. Feel free to let me know in the comments what choices you would have made, how you feel about my choices, or anything else interesting you found. I'd love to hear some feedback. And, of course, thank you for watching. Thank you for sticking through this, uh, another very, very long video <laughs> in this kind of weird essay format. Anyway, that's all from me. See you all again in an amount of time, hopefully less than between the last video and this one, but probably not. Peace be with you.